if you understand the fundamentals of data and attribution and reporting, like how data is getting reported, what, how the attribution process is exactly working, you have solved 70% of your problem. And then you go into the campaign space, understanding what kind of levers you're left with, and then you try to maximize from the set of levers that you've worked with. Welcome to Mobile Growth and Pancakes, a podcast by Stormaven. We break down how and why mobile apps grow. In each episode, we invite a mobile growth expert onto the show to break down a specific mobile growth strategy, how it worked, why it worked, and what they would do differently. I'm your host, Esther Schatz. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Mobile Growth and Pancakes. I'm your host, Jonathan Fishman, and I'm really excited to be here today with Piyush Mishra, who's head of uh, growth marketing at Product Madness. Hey. Hello, everyone. Hello, Jonathan. How are you doing? I'm doing uh, pretty good. It's, It's really hot. Everywhere, you know, it seems that it's everywhere. Not, not in London. <laughs> I think uh, luckily today is, a, today is one of the better days. Although we did hit 40 degrees last week. So <laughs> yeah, I heard. So I'm based in Tel Aviv and I'm like uh, trying to stay well within air conditioned uh, spaces. It's uh, really hot. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. So uh, today uh, we want to talk a bit about the future of uh, mobile game distribution. And there's a lot to talk about there. Uh, But before that, uh, do you want to introduce yourself and kind of the path that that you went through until you got to uh, where you are today? Sure thing. Uh, so I'm Piyush Mishra. I'm, I'm head of growth marketing at Product Madness, uh, mostly looking at the platforms and we call it platform innovation, innovation team because we sort of look after the platforms that we are using, the ad tech tools that we are using and stuff. And also the future because we are the team which uh, needs to be prepared for all the bigger changes that are coming in, including Google Privacy Sandbox, Scan 4.0. Facebook making its own, you know, data model and stuff. So everything that is out there in the that that will redefine sort of uh, how we do growth is something that we need to look forward, look uh, look into. Uh, so I started my journey into this industry within Mobi uh, back in 2015. So I started as a at a very low level as a campaign manager. That's I think the doing the grind work of setting up the campaign and sort of. Uh, you know, uploading 500 creatives in a day and stuff like that. <laughs> that used to be my days when I started working with bigger clients like Uber, Facebook, uh, and uh, Pandora and Hulu, mostly, mostly catering to any market. Uh, Uber was an interesting journey because uh, Uber became one of my major clients. And, uh, you know, sort of I started looking into Uber globally uh, as an accountant. We were spending quite a lot of money because InMobi was pretty big in China and China does not have Google or Facebook. So in movie was automatically big uh, as an as an as an ad tech uh, uh, you know over there. So worked there for two years, two and a half years, and uh, sort of Uber guys were sort of impressed with my work over there, and they uh, called me over. So I switched to the client side, and I started looking uh, into performance marketing for Uber and slowly for Uber Eats, uh, where sort of I got the overall exposure beyond uh, an ad network, and I started looking after UAC, Facebook. Google, uh, you know, Twitter, every single channel that was out there and slowly start looking into brand marketing as well. So I did offline marketing, TV, radio, uh, you know, OH uh, and everything. Obviously coming from a digital world, when you do TV and OH, uh, it's, it's quite, a, quite a difficult journey, but it was interesting. Uh, and from there on, I sort of shifted. I wanted to change the city. I shifted to London. Uh, I took over this role uh, at Product Madness, uh, entered gaming for the first time. Now it's been almost two and a half years. And yeah. Uh, here I am at this podcast. How do you find th- that? That's a pretty awesome path. How how do you find the difference between like coming in from like app performance marketing to game performance marketing? Like, is it very different? Like, how how was it? I mean, the fundamental difference is I think gaming relies very heavily on performance marketing, while an app based company is very much dependent on how you create a brand along with performance marketing. I think that's a very fundamental difference. Because brand marketing was pretty big back at Uber. And I, was, I joined during the startup days. So it was really fun also. You know, we we're trying to expand. We we're trying to expand to new cities. Every, every week we we're launching new cities and you had to do the marketing plan, everything from digital to uh, on, uh, you know, uh, uh, branding space. The weird thing is with the iOS 14 changes, I'm seeing a lot of companies, gaming companies going back to doing branding. So you know, I don't know if that difference uh, exists any longer, but like, those that that was that was quite a quite a change for me when I switched here. Yeah, I definitely see the same thing with uh, we work with some of the biggest uh, game companies uh, in the world and a lot of uh, apps, a lot of other brands. So I definitely see that. Uh, but but the one thing that is really interesting is that a lot of game companies take a more scientific approach or more pragmatic approach to 
to brand, of like thinking about what kind of activities they can run, be it TV or billboards or whatever, uh, and how that actually drives a quantifiable uh, value. And it's really hard to measure. It's, it's, you, can, you can get a good grasp of, of the value that it creates, but it does actually increase brand, branded search in the app store. And there's a lot of things that you can measure. So it's fun to see. It, in my view, a lot of game companies are like always one step ahead of, of uh, brands uh, in terms of how scientific or how, how uh, pragmatic are they when thinking about marketing. Yeah, For sure. I agree with you on that. But there is one difference though. I think when you're working for a company like Uber or any e-commerce or fintech, when they're trying to create a brand as well, I think they are more creative to brand building as compared to a gaming company, while gaming company is much more data oriented when it comes to brand building. So I don't know how to, how to say this because brand is uh, definitely a mix of both because you know uh, tracking is not always a big, big part on, on the brand side. I mean, although you can do a guess way, uh, guess work of it. But you know, at the end of the day, it's also I feel that when you're trying to create a brand, sometimes you have to take that leap of faith uh, you know, in there. It's not just purely data-backed research that would uh, make sure that you have a very good output. But and you have to also couple that with the performance very heavily on the gaming side. Yep. So um, let's start talking about like the future of distribution. Um, I think this topic was like if you would go a few years ago, it was it wasn't even a topic. Like nobody thought that anything would break the the distribution paradigm of having the App Store on the iOS side, having the Google Play Store on the Android side. Of course, in Southeast Asia and China specifically, there were a lot of other stores uh, on the Android side. But that was it. If you were a game developer or marketer, these were the stores. Um, distribution, as you said, mostly on the game side, but uh, it heavily depended on paid advertisement on platforms such as Facebook and Google that controlled that part of the market. And about uh, and with iOS 14.5, everything changed. Uh, so it gave rise to this type of conversation of how game distribution, mobile game distribution is going to look like in, in the future. So I think in order to unpack this, uh, there's two sides for this conversation or two parts uh, for it. There's first um, the the changes in how players find and discover new games. I mean, and the, we'll talk about this in a sec. And the second one is um, what's going to happen to the app stores? Because there's a lot of things uh, happening specifically in the European Union with some new pieces of legislation that were approved extremely fast, like it really surprised everybody on the legal side of things, uh, but they were al- they already passed and, and they have a lot of implications um, around, you know, for Apple and for Google around how much control they have around the app store and, you know, giving rise to other alternative app stores in the West as well. So we'll, we'll touch that uh, after the first point, but to begin with, I would like to you know, kind of understand your thoughts around how how players discover games uh, these days. Uh, in the past, it was really dependent on Facebook. Like folks who were on Facebook and other social networks, and and uh, they saw ads that were extremely uh, targeted based on Facebook uh, user graph, and that was kind of how folks discovered mobile. Uh, games. It it wasn't really just based on going to the app store and and browsing. So. Um, how did that change? So the change that I'm seeing, at least uh, on our end, uh, basically is I, I'll, I'll break this into two different and sort of different approach. I'll say one is a, a, there's a huge rise of community driven gaming experience. So instead of just going and searching for games, I think there's a lot of community building that is happening, especially with Reddit and Discord and YouTube and uh, Twitch was all uh, were already there, right? Uh, there's a huge rise in, in, in the number of people who are going on those platforms, trying to figure out which is the app that is becoming popular in the community and sort of playing as a community all together over there. That's a big shift that is happening. And that's why, you know, that's a very specific uh, way of doing marketing as well. I think a lot of gaming companies are giving, getting into that space as well, which is why Discord and Reddit, for example, do have, they do allow advertising, for example, right? And you can create your own community as well. And you can start uh, you know, sort of propagating more information, more features about the product. I think product, ma- ma- product, product marketing managers and product managers would really love to be part of it. So one big change that is happening is towards uh, finding new games through community-based uh, uh, you know, uh, apps or platforms or whatever. 
The other interesting bit that is happening at the same time is the rise of uh, Apple Arcade. And we did a podcast on that literally uh, two weeks ago you know, in, in the sandbox with, and like I was speaking to the to Mobility where, where they had sort of launched a couple of games, uh, you know, on Apple Arcade. It's a very interesting phenomenon uh, because like it's, it's, it's mainly gaming. It's only gaming. And, you know, at the end of the day, it becomes a place once you get a subscription, it becomes a place where you're literally playing a game which is technically top rated and you're not seeing any ads. So there is a rise of Apple Arcade as well happening. I don't know how successful it will be because it's a subscription based sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, arena, but like, let's see how that goes. Third thing that I want to add over here is also what uh, I call the Netflix problem. If I go to the app store as a gamer and I, I don't know what I want to play, but if I, if I search for, I don't know, slots, they're like 15 slot based games. Now there are, that's the problem of plenty. Like it's the same thing that you go to Netflix and you don't know what, uh, what do you want to watch and you end up watching friends again. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's sort of, it's sort of a same problem that you don't know which game do you want to try. There is no longer that brand that is standing out. Right. I mean, there used to be a world where there used to be King and there used to be, uh, you know, Rovio and Angry Birds and everything. Like we know that, okay, these are the games that we want to play. But now like in any category, there are just so many games and there are so many copies out there that you don't know what exactly is the game that you want to try to, that you want, that we really want to play. So I think that's also an interesting area. I don't, I, I'm not, I'm not sure what's the solution there, but the first two options that I said uh, is the change that I'm seeing, uh, you know, uh, for discovery, let's say discovery of an app. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. I think that it's um, like the kind of situation that was created with uh, like in the previous era uh, was that uh, folks with a lot of budgets, uh, got an unfair share of voice. I mean, they folks were browsing Facebook and scrolling through the feeds or Instagram or whoever, wherever they were. And they also didn't see the, the best games. They saw the games with the, the biggest budgets. Now, it poses the question whether those games uh, are the best uh, because they're obviously the biggest businesses in the, in the field, but uh, I'm not sure that they're the best. Um, so, so that's how uh, it, it was kind of like the the push versus pull uh, dynamic. It was a push mechanic where the games were pushed into an audience. Facebook knew very well who, who you were and what kind of games do you play and and where do you spend money and what are you very likely to want to play next. And they pushed that next game to you. But I think Facebook is sort of losing some uh, you know the, the audience at the same time. And I mean they want people to move to Oculus in, in the future forever. But like I think TikTok at the same time is taking its place uh, in a in a in a small by small manner because TikTok, like if you look at there's another trend that's happening. And I wanted to get your opinion on that as well, because sure. I, I'm seeing that trend. Netflix is getting into gaming. Amazon is already into gaming. Uh, you know, uh, TikTok is getting into gaming. They bought a gaming studio. Facebook was always there. They all the bigger players are getting into gaming. And you know, they would launch big apps, but I just feel that they would stand with their brand because their brand is very strong already. Like Netflix as a brand is very strong. Amazon as a brand is very strong. That's not the case with any other gaming specific companies because their brand is not very strong. Like it's the game that speaks for them, right? So do you see that uh, uh, this this bigger players coming in and sort of disrupting the market in certain sense? I do, definitely. And and I actually have a thought about Netflix for quite some time because when... And it's a huge challenge for Netflix, by the way, to enter into gaming because, as you know, creating games and scaling games is extremely hard. It's it's a really hard thing to do. Most folks fail. Most studios fail with most of their games. Uh, it, it's just a hard thing to do. And you can't just be a company that uh, understands, um, you know, streaming and media and, and films and series um, and just all of a sudden understand games and, and be successful with that. But I think that that's the, their original plan was uh, to actually be way more involved in creating the games, uh, specifically as like games that accompany a series or a certain IP, like it was a game for Stranger Things. And they kind of went back from that. And these days, what, what at least what I see there is that they act as a publishing platform for a lot of different developers. And... And what they're doing there is is a natural evolution because if you think about it, um, Facebook was the place where folks discovered games because people, at least up until recently, you know, when Facebook was slightly stronger, uh, that's where they spent time. Most of the world spent a lot of time in the Facebook app every single day. 
Netflix is also taking up a lot of these uh, th- that uh, that time. Like a lot of people are spending time in the Netflix app, whether it's in on their TV, on their phone, on their computer. They, they spend a lot of time there, so they accumulated uh, hundreds of millions of people uh, that go in to a certain place. So they have a way to divert, you know, demand for things through ads uh, in a very good way. They also know a lot of things about uh, these users. They know what you watch. And, you know, and, and that tell, tells you a lot of things about what kind of gamer or player or what kind of games can interest you. So they can craft that mechanic where they have a huge asset that gets a lot of people like a magnet to come to them and then divert it to games. It makes a lot of sense from a, a business perspective. Um, and they, they can get even more eyeballs than the app store at some point. Like, uh, like if you compare to the amount of people that go into the app store uh, each and every week. So it's uh, so I think we're going to see a lot of companies that have a huge entertainment asset like a Netflix that get these that scale of an audience and then try to layer uh, on top of that games. It's the IP, right? It's at the end of the day, it's the IP that they have. But we have seen a lot of big companies having an IP and still fail, you know, uh, at 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 gaming because it's just hard. It's it it's just hard because the expertise yeah. to do this. You need to have a company that is at the same time an expert in making games, scaling games, and creating that entertainment asset, as they call it, like that platform, such as Facebook or Netflix. It's not that easy like to have one company that does it all. Uh, Facebook games is not a huge success. I mean, they're, they're, they tried it a lot, um, and, and it's just really hard. But what I think I see that is a bit more interesting from the gaming side is a lot of game companies, at least the biggest, the biggest game companies, or I should say entertainment companies in the world, um, building huge portfolio of games that if you, you know, accumulate, if you add up all the uh, MAUs of all these games, you get to, again, hundreds of millions of users, and then they own a huge audience uh, that they own. Uh, they learn a lot of things about this audience. They don't need to share this data with any ad network, and they can start cross-promoting new games to an existing audience because it's so big. It represents like a, a, a big chunk of the world's, uh, of the world uh, gamers audience, at least. It goes back to your original point, right? Which is like when you own the app and when you own the distribution channel, you, you have a lot of data to play around with and you don't want people to sort of get out of that uh, space. So I think, you know, let, let's see. I mean, it's interesting. Let's see. Let's see how this evolves. So. Yeah, I think the, the, the most future-proof uh, strategy that they see in the mobile game space is mobile game companies trying to own their audience, trying to, and you see this all around. You see the consolidation happening. Um, oh yeah. And uh, just we just we just uh, I don't know when you were listening to this, but uh, last week it was announced that uh, Unity is a, uh, merging slash acquiring Iron Source. Uh, that created a lot of backlash. That was interesting to follow. Um, but uh, how do how do you see that? There's like a lot of consolidation where each party has some piece of the pie in terms of data, but they can't make a lot of, uh, they can't make good use of it because they don't have the other side. So for example, a game engine becoming an ad network, uh, an iron source, of course, owns Supersonic, which is a pretty successful hyper-casual studio. Now they have games. So this vertical integration happening, what do you think about that? Look, mergers do happen, but I think the pace of mergers since IS 14.5 release that's what I think that's, that's been a sort of a worrisome trend because at the core of it, it's finances, right? I mean, you, you know, that unity and dinosaurs would have a similar sort of a background from, from one of the, from the, one of the major investors is common, right? So that's one of the major reasons why they went ahead with it. But the problem is in a world where there is no personalized data, let's say three years, four years down the line, you have to sort of lock the amount of data that you have, and you have to sort of use that data to create an engine where you're able to find users for any game company to work work. And if you look at the fun, if you look at how sort of the mergers have happened, for example, with Apple Win as well, the Max merger, right? And similarly with Liftoff and Wungle merger and with Unity and Iron Source merger, these used to be independent platforms altogether. But all of a sudden they have realized that they can't be segregated because at the end of the day, if you think very strategically about this, let's say I'm running with Liftoff as an advertiser, I'm running with Wungle, I'm running with uh, Unity and I'm running with uh, like, I don't know, Iron Source, all four. I'm essentially buying the same user. I'm bidding against my own inventory. For example, in a social casino space, I know I'm buying against other social casino companies in a social casino space uh, in the apps, right? So for, for example, I'm, I'm more or less competing against each other. So from an advertiser standpoint, I like that as an ad network or a DSP, there are less number of options out there because I just believe that there's an overlap of inventory happening in there. 
But the problem is that consolidation also leads to a lot of anywhere. I mean, I don't see a monopoly happening anyway. Consolidation is nice to a level that it doesn't become a monopoly. That's that's my bigger point. That that's true. Uh, obviously, I mean the the market is so big that it's hard. Like on the in app advertising space, uh, outside of the self attributing networks, it's kind of hard to create a monopoly. Although we can see like the market share, uh, pretty much uh, you know how it how it what's the shape of it, and it's becoming sort of an uh, I don't know how to it's not a monopoly, but it's like oligopoly, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, it's like th- there's a few players there, um, but it's really hard to 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 get that. But I think like part of what you're seeing in in this M and A trend in the ad tech space is the mediation wars. It's a lot about that. It's uh, who, yeah, it is. But uh, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, fundamentally, why it's happening is because in a world when where you're buying users, right? Because you had user level data, every single algorithm can experiment, succeed better. They can compete with each other. In a world when there is no user level data, you're actually buying an audience. When you're buying an audience or an inventory at one place or a pocket of inventory, essentially you're trying to sort of buy your similar inventory across three or four different places, right? And that's the fundamental reason of why consolidations are happening because they're starting to see that, you know, okay, if, I'm, if we are separate right now, we're not going to see a lot of advertising money come our way because right now, if I have to choose in iOS, I'd rather work with one of these four or two of these four. I won't work with all four, but in a world where there were user level data, because I knew we were buying specific users with a specific history of how they have played the game, what kind of credit card they have, what kind of you know user level data, whatever we had at that point in time, we knew we were buying specific users and one of them would turn out to be a whale and it, uh, the campaign would perform better for us, right? So it's, it's sort of that change also that is happening. And with iOS 14 happening and also Google Privacy Sandbox, which we don't, know a lot about but you know it's happening in that world i believe look at how srns have reacted self-reporting networks used to be completely independent like mmps like obviously they were reporting to mmps but they had their own uh, way of uh, doing the attribution right the reason i like scan i have a lot of issues with scan but the reason i like scan is because it created a level playing field for everybody except apple search ads but <laughs> we'll, we'll keep that separate you know uh it created a level playing field at least for every single uh platform out there including facebook and google and uh you know uh snapchat and uh, lift up everybody were at the same level playing field and then you start seeing the true numbers then you realize okay you know some of these data points are not making sense i mean in the previous world it used to make sense but now they're not so it's also like the change that is happening is Facebook, for example, sort of started not sending user level data on Android also. They paused it, right? They're saying, I'm not going to send it directly to the advertiser. I can share it with the MMP, but I'm not going to share it with the advertiser. Why? Because it's reactionary. Instead of being uh, you know, reactive, they're being proactive in this case with the changes that are about to come on, uh, on, on, the, on the Android side. So the changes that are happening is all triggered by Every single company out there trying to say that, okay, we are privacy focused. Although for advertising to work at a personal level, you need to have more data. Uh, it, it's, it, you know, it's, it's an exciting time in that sense. And uh, uh, yeah, I mean, going back to your merger point, it's basically happening because of uh, what I said, like shift from a user buying to an audience buying. And, you know, also the big shift that happened with IS-14 uh, changes. Yeah, I, I also think about it from a developer perspective, especially like small to mid developers. Um, it seems like what is forming is like some, you know, a few different uh, entities that that would act as publishing platforms. Like you come to us to publish and they have everything from the game engine to a lot of different game services that you need in order to develop a game to everything around creatives and growth. Like if you think about what Unity has now from end to end, it's it's kind of like the the entire package. Um, so a developer would have to basically choose which publishing partner they want because it's going to be impossible to get uh, that advantage on your own unless you're you're joining forces with them. True, true, Jonathan. But wouldn't you wouldn't you say that you know uh, I mean the basics the basis of growth marketing actually dictates that you know you need to put your eggs in multiple baskets. It can't be just one basket, right? Because from one place you're getting quality from one place you're getting scale and you always try to balance it all the time. So would you prefer that working with just one partner in that twist or would you have rather have five, six partners where we are trying to sort of balance which one is giving you ROS, which one is giving you quality, which one is giving you scale and, you know, sort of as a developer, I'm saying. 
Yeah, 100%. I agree with you. I prefer the, the previous era if I was uh, a game developer. Um, it's not good for small developers at the moment. Like it is going to lock them into something. I don't know exactly how, uh, these companies would, would want to engage with them in terms of like join our platform and you get access to a game engine. I don't know, a service to build your game economy, a PVP type of mechanic, everything like out of the box and you get access to our creative studio, our creative technology, our ad network, and it's exclusive. If you use our stuff, you can access it. I don't know how they, they're going to you know, start navigating that landscape, but definitely it's worse for game developers because um, you will be you know, partnering up or locking yourself in, in with uh, one such entity. And the problem is that most of these entities are basically um, outside of Unity Game Engine, of course, and that's why a lot of the backlash happened in the past uh, couple of weeks around that merger, uh, is a lot of these platforms are basically advertising people. Uh, they're ad tech people, and unfortunately, they don't have a lot of trust <laughs> in, this, in this market. It's the lack of trust also. I mean, that's what people reacted to. I just an app deal as well. You know, one was an MMP, the other was an, uh, was an ad sure. network. And, you know, so it's it's sort of a similar, uh, in, it's in the similar space, I'll say. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Cool. I do want to uh, uh, make sure we cover another point here, which is um, the future of app stores. Like, we'll, we'll just we don't have time for like one question about that. But basically, in the past few weeks, uh, two pieces of legislation passed in the European Union. One of them is called the Digital Markets Act, and the other one is called the D- Digital Services Act. Long story short, uh, if you read into these uh, pieces of legislation, it uh, says it's very clear that if you're a platform, a, a, a huge platform uh, in the mobile space and you're offering apps, which is basically the app store, uh, you can't ban uh, sideloading. You have to allow sideloading and you have to allow for a landscape where there are multiple ways to discover and download apps. It can't only be from your app store. So that, that basically opens up the question of, uh, will we see a situation where in the West, um, there's going to be a lot of different app stores, maybe for, let's say, I don't know, different genres, different demographics, different, like there's going to be companies that would, you know, rise to the occasion and, and open up their own app store with competitive prices, less commission. Um, and, uh, and for every user, you would have to, I don't know, you would get a phone and you had to choose, you would have to choose which app store do you want or to choose to download multiple ones. And this is how you, uh, discover games. It's definitely interesting, Jonathan, how, how things are shaping up and especially with the European Union's kind of forcing it on Apple specifically, uh, you know. But I'll tell you what, how the evolution would be a bit different. It's allowed on Google, right? You can have different app stores on Google, for example. And it's happening in like China and India and other places. They have multiple app stores. But different app stores usually and typically are coming from the device makers. So Xiaomi is a device maker. That's why they have an app store. Samsung is a device, uh, device maker. That's why they have an app store. In case of Apple, they, only, they are the only device maker. Apple controls the device. That's why Apple controls the software. They don't have multiple. It's not an open uh, source system, right? In Apple's world, they are the device maker. They are the owner of the software. They are the owner of everything. In Google's world, they are just providing the software. I mean, they also have hardware and Google Pixel and stuff. But like every single device maker out there can build their own app store. And when you build your own app store, the reason to do it is because you already have a device now you can now you have a lot more data points in that world, and then you can do. You know, I I used to be in conversation with Samsung at one point in time. We were trying to get Uber app to be inserted into their Samsung app store, and the kind of deals that we were trying to negotiate was really really interesting because they have a, they had a lot of data at that point in time, because they were saying that you know I can also do retargeting to the user because the app already exists, and we can ask them to download the app Uber or Uber Eats, and you know sort of install and. Uh, use it, or if it is not taking a ride, we want to send them a push notification also at the same time. So it's th- that's why I'm I'm a bit skeptical on that front. I like the idea for sure. Don't get me wrong. Uh, you know, we, there needs to be more uh, transparency on this side. Thirty percent commission is pretty high as for any developer out there, and every single developer is trying to come up with more innovative ways of sort of uh, fixing that. Uh, but you know, at the end of the day, it's uh, the evolution. I don't know if it'll be similar to how it happened in the east. Uh, but you know, it's, it's, it's definitely interesting. Let's see how, uh, I, like you said, maybe different genres, maybe gaming genre will have their own uh, app store or maybe uh, fintech. Yeah, for sure. I, I think that we, we see the first, uh, signs 
for it. Like at least we started seeing them a couple of years ago with Epic Games opening, you know, with, you know, basically leading that battle against uh, Google and commissions and, and everything. So the, the Epic Games store and uh, you see a lot, some things are pretty, uh, pretty odd, like um, Activision, Blizzard, everybody has their own uh, launcher, as they call it, but it can easily become their own, uh, their own store. And then again, it goes into my previous point where you'd see uh, these kind of entities being formed, like it could be a game engine or game development tools. It could be all the growth tools, it, and it could also be their own distribution um, if they are able to actually accumulate like re- a really interesting variety of, of high quality games and create something that, you know, even similar to Apple Arcade. You would see a lot of subscription uh, services that would allow you to access these games. And I'm a user for Apple Arcade, by the way, and, and I think it's, uh, it, it's, you know, it really changes the way that you play, uh, that you play games or discover games. Yeah. Definitely. And, and, you know, like, I don't know what is good for consumer, though. Uh, I don't know how the market would react in the future because right now you have only one app store where you go and you can download whatever you want. As a, consumer myself, I know I told about the Netflix of Netflix problem, like you have a lot of options out there, but I still prefer that method as compared to every single app store from a user standpoint, I'm saying not as a developer, as a developer, I would prefer having multiple app stores, but as a user, I'm saying like, you know, would I want Activision to have their own, uh, you know, app store and uh, EA games to have their own app store and stuff. I'm not sure right now. It depends on how the market would react. Uh, there is a reason why there's a single app store. It, it's the ease of use. It's the ease of access as well. Uh, you know, you can have different distribution channels, but those distribution channels need to be sort of uh, uh, need to have enough user base for you to actually, uh, you know, benefit from lower commission at the end of the day. If, for example, App Store, Apple App Store is giving you scale, and your own distribution channel is not, and you're still paying thirty percent commission, I don't know which one would you like to prefer. So there are pros and cons, but. Uh, Going back to your original point, I think it's a great idea to open it up and see how the market reacts. Yeah, I think it's it's also going to be a lot about but, but two things, like what you said about around commissions, like who's go, who's going to offer uh, the most competitive rate. And obviously, the starting point is really bad for Apple because they were charging a lot for this. Um, but the second one is audiences. Like, I don't know if it's... Um, Again, I'm just talking from the developer perspective, not from the consumer perspective, and I see your point. Um, but from a developer perspective, if I want to publish on a certain store and then I get to advertise within that platform, like similar to search ads, uh, I can suddenly have access to, for example, EA audience, the uh, Activision audience. And, and these are very different and really high quality audiences. And that could pull me in as well. But uh, I get it from the consumer perspective. Probably it won't stay that there's like, a hundred different stores. Uh, it would, uh, uh, like everything in, in economy and capitalism, it would uh, consolidate. Exactly. And that's why, that's my problem. Like, I mean, if you look at, as I said, on the Android side, it's coming from a device space, like Samsung, uh, you know, Xiaomi, Huawei, every single company got getting their own app store. So I don't know how that would happen on the Apple side because you've got only one device maker. So yeah, let's, let's see. Sure. Cool. So we don't have a lot of time left, but I do want to ask you a few uh, questions that we ask all of our guests. Um, so let's start, given taking everything we talked about into consideration, like what would be a tip uh, for, for a performance marketer operating in, you know, marketing for a mobile game and uh, how to thrive in this environment? Like how, what do you need to do to start finding your audiences, relying on, on partners that have less data than what they used to and thus less capability to get you the, your audiences and offering you targeting? I think, uh, I mean, fundamentally one recommendation that I would, or one suggestion that I would give to all performance marketers is to understand the data that you're receiving. Right now we live in a world where the data is not consistent across the board. I mean, if you just pick iOS, you have scanned 2.0, 2.2, 3.0, 4.0, 4.0 coming in different sort of measurement, different sort of data points that you're receiving. You're receiving probabilistic at the same time. Snapchat is doing its own thing. Facebook is doing its own thing. TikTok is doing its own thing. Similarly, on the Android side, you have uh, right now with Android 12, like sort of uh, no opt-in. Uh, you know, you're having users who are sort of saying that you're not going to get personalized data and stuff. So understanding what kind of data you are receiving from individual part, then how the, like, if you understand what kind of data you're receiving, then you can understand how their algorithm could work in that space. And then you can apply your mind and understand, okay, which channel would give you what kind of capacity. For example, right, right now, if you like, 
one of the very small things that I that I always mention is like for uh, you know when I when I this was like two years ago I realized that AppsFlyer uh, or any of the MMPs out there or not just AppsFlyer any of the MMPs out there would have a retention policy with any of the partners. So technically they can't keep the identifiers of the data or whatever for a longer period of time than certain number of days that they are liable for. So even if you say in that well that your reattribution window is lifetime, it's not technically lifetime because you can't, if you don't retain the data, you can't sort of understand when the user was coming back. So the definition of a reinstall in this case uh, is technically not true. So I'm, I'm just saying like, I'm, the reason to give this example is saying that if you understand the fundamentals of data and attribution and reporting, like how data is getting reported, what how the attribution process is actually working, you have solved 70% of your problem. And then you go into the campaign space, understanding what kind of levers you're left with, and then you try to uh, maximize from uh, the set of levers that you've worked with. So I, I keep on telling every performance marketer out there to understand and adjust very quickly with the changes that are happening. Because every two weeks, three weeks, each of the platform are doing their own thing. Uh, you know, the, the problem with privacy is now Facebook and TikTok and Snapchat, everybody's sort of trying to champion that and in the process, giving us less data. So you know, it's no longer just Apple and Google running the same, the show. It's everybody getting in and saying, okay, we are privacy focused and we want to limit the data that we're sending. And every single week, every single month, some changes are happening that you're not aware of, that you should be aware of. So that's that's my bigger point. That's a great tip. Uh, and building on top of that, like uh, it seems like you, you live in the future a lot. Like you're, you're one of your... Um, uh, your job basically is to understand what's changing and, and where things are going. So how do you stay up to date? Like, do you have a, um, like a content recommendation, like a newsletter, a podcast, uh, stuff that you write? Uh, no, so I, I like, uh, I personally believe if like having a lot more connection in the industry and people, like my source of knowledge becomes people more or less. I mean, obviously you read from different places, you do Google search, you go to a uh, help section of different MMPs and um, different blogs, or Storm events, including, you know, like you go there, you try to read everything. But, you know, my my main source is talking to different people from different game, different developers also in the gaming space, talking to different experts across the board from DSPs to MMPs to, uh, you know, SRNs to, uh, you know, talking to the talking to the product team. I try and make sure that I, I'm talking to the product team of Facebook. I try and make sure I'm talking to the product team of a Liftoff or any other company out there because I learn a lot when I talk to them and I understand where they're coming from, what kind of uh, nuances that we are not able to understand why exactly a campaign is behaving in this way and that way. So whenever I see any change, I try to reach out with the product team and understand that. So for me, the major source is talking to people. Uh, it's not any specific blog or resources, although there are a lot out there. I mean, uh, if uh, like, you know, even I, I host a podcast in the sandbox with I talk to a lot of people about the future of ad tech and you know, gaming in general. So that's, that's also very interesting if anybody wants to give it a listen. Awesome. We'll include the, the link in the description of this episode. Uh, but, but I definitely agree with you, like building up your network and having a lot of folks you can reach out and like, um, you know, run, run your, run your ideas by and, and talk a bit about like where things are going. It's definitely, uh, the most important thing in my opinion as well, like having your community, your tribe. Exactly. And, you know, like, because like, for example, I live in a space of social casino, but I don't understand what's happening from a hyper casual standpoint, but understanding that could help me in, I don't know, creating a conversion schema, for example. So just, just, you know, just giving an example, like talking to everybody across the board, not just staying in your own sub genre of gaming or anything like that. You know, it's, it's, it's always handy. Cool. Awesome. And, and one last question, um, What's and the most important question, obviously, what is your favorite flavor of pancake? Yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm an Indian dude. I don't eat a lot of pancakes, but since the show is named Mobile Growth and Pancakes, I have. So the one that I really like is the American style, which is fluffier and, you know, sort of, uh, uh, I, I like the fluffy pancakes. So that, that'd be my. Oh, so you should try uh, Japanese, Japanese pancakes. Yeah, They're it's really good. Kind of insane. It's like the most fluffiest pancake you can imagine it's like this thick it's like insane um next time you're in tokyo yeah oh i'm going for it today <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah. <laughs> i'll, I'll figure it. somewhere somewhere in uh, london we can, i'm pretty sure we'll find it <laughs> yeah yeah look up japanese pancakes it's it's really good for the recommendation cool and if folks want to reach out to you and talk and you just uh yeah how can they reach out to you so oh, definitely linkedin is i'm very active on linkedin uh and, uh, you know, uh, because of uh, having my own podcast, because I, I love to talk to people and talk to them, argue with them, debate with them, understand their point of view, everything. 
I, I just love talking about, uh, uh, you know, advertising space and learning from them. Uh, so just anybody, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm always active there. Awesome. Cool. So that was uh, really fun. I really enjoyed talking with you uh, on, on the attic space, but uh, it's, it's, you have a ton of insights and I wish we could uh, continue this for another hour, uh, but we'll stay in touch. I want to talk with you on a lot of things. No, definitely, Jonathan. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the invitation. And it was really lovely talking to you. Thanks for the invitation. Awesome. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. And that was Mobile Growth and Pancakes. To find out more about StoreMaven and how we can improve App Store performance, visit StoreMaven.com. And then make sure to search for Mobile Growth and Pancakes and Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, or anywhere else podcasts are found, and click subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at StoreMaven, thanks for listening.